Oh, it looks like we're going live a little bit early here, um, which is fine. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people jumping on at about nine to take a peek at what's going on. But uh, with that said, good morning, Morgan. What's going on? Chris, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, man. You know, so we talked a little bit uh, last time that we were on. I thought it was really important um, that we start having more conversations, you know, so last time we talked and we met up on Fallbrook Village Talk, we talked a little bit about the California gun laws. Um, we talked about, uh, training, uh, using a weapon. I mean, it was, it was impressive for me because I learned so much. Uh, you know, I, I own firearms. I was in the Marine Corps for a long time. I'm retired as well. And, um, I, I learned a lot just from our last interview. I mean, it was huge for me. And we also, uh, talked a little bit about, um, in the last interview, uh, concealed carries and things like that. But, you know, you reached out to me, uh, I think it was what it was late last week and we were trying to set up something for this week because a, I wanted to start doing something at least once a month with you. I thought it was important, uh, to get this information out there, but you said that you just got back from a conference and at that conference, you all were talking a little bit about, uh, active school shooters. Now, from my opinion, um, I think it's a sensitive topic for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to talk about uh, active shooters in a school. It's uh, it's happened. It's happened before. And I, it's, I, I'm, I hope it never happens again, but it's possible that it could happen again. And I think by putting our heads in the sand and acting like it, it, it can't happen again or it won't happen again, or if we get rid of guns, then it won't happen. Uh, I think the right way of, of, of doing it is to actually say, well, what can we do in order to protect our children, protect our school teachers, uh, and, and, and protect our campuses? I think that's a better way of looking at things. And let me, and you know, and I, I, I put some thought into this. I'm going to have you add some to this in a second, but put some thought behind this. So whether I was in Iraq or Afghanistan, um, we had, everybody had a loaded weapon. And especially like the last tour I did in Afghanistan, uh, we had the Afghani army and other Afghans that had loaded weapons on our bases as well. And you're always kind of walking around hoping somebody doesn't have a bad day, uh, hoping somebody doesn't decide that they felt offended by somebody else and they start unloading ammo. Uh, which has happened overseas, um, you know, uh, especially with uh, in, in Afghanistan, it happened to the British where an Afghani uh, walked in and started unloading uh, on the British. But you're hoping somebody doesn't have a bad day. But we we go through processes, procedures. What happens if there is this? And the difference is that every, everybody is armed. So if somebody goes and becomes an active shooter on a base, they're going to get shot. Now, let's go back to a school school. Uh, and I'm just kind of throwing out different topics because I want you to educate me. And I'm just I like being inquisitive on these topics. I know it's been brought up. Well, we should arm every school teacher. So every school teacher has the ability to protect students and protect themselves. To me, if you do that, then it kind of feel it's going to end up feeling like how I felt uh, sitting on a base out in Afghanistan, hoping you're hoping somebody doesn't have a bad day. Now, the the chances of that happening where we arm every teacher or even have armed teachers in the state of California, I think are pretty, pretty slim. So if that's the case, what can we do? What, you know, so that's been, that's been my question. You know, I have young children that are in school and I, if, if something like that happens, I personally would want the children to be trained. I would want the administration and, and this and the teachers to be trained on what they should be doing in order to protect our children. Uh, so that's just me. So with all of that said, I, I I'm just going to kind of start turning this over to you uh, and let you just kind of run through. What'd you get at the conference, bud? Yeah. So um, a couple different things. Um, active shooter events or active assailant, uh, violent critical incidents, whatever you want to call them, um, they are what we call low probability, high impact. So the likelihood of them are they're almost as statistical compared to other threats or hazards, but the consequences are far worse than those other hazards. For example, we have high exposure to wildfires here in California. We've all experienced it as a community. But if we look at the consequences, there's damages to property. Uh, but specifically, when we're talking about schools, there has not been a child killed in a school since like 1958 throughout the United States. Um, if we look at earthquakes, high probability or higher probability um, than active shooter events. But there hasn't been a um, child killed in a church 
um, somewhere in like the, the early 80s to late 70s. Right. Hey, Morgan, hold on one second. It looks like somebody says your mic. Um, can you uh, can you scoot up a little more and maybe just speak a little bit louder? It sounds like it might be it might be cutting in and out a little bit. Let's see. Can you guys still see me? Oh, yeah, I can see you. OK, thank you for uh, whoever commented that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Greg. We appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, school active shooter events, um, low probability, high consequence, right? Uh, so when we're when we're doing a um, a threat assessment or a hazard th assessment, we take both of those factors into consideration. So now, when we're talking about consequences, it's not just li loss of life or people injured or wounded. It is the impact on the community. It is the continuity of services. It is. If this school is now shut down, how does that impact students and teachers within this community? So we're looking at all these factors. So um, I am the a uh, founding partner and the director of strategic planning for DMB Consultants. We're an emergency management consulting firm that specializes in K-12 education. Um, our office is here in Fallbrook, but we work throughout Southern California. The largest school district we work with is Cajon Valley Unified down in El Cajon, 27 schools. They're a uh, K through eight um, district, 15,000 students, you know, 2,500 staff members. So very large district down there. Uh, and we do everything emergency management, not just active shooter, but that's what we specialize in. And that's what I specialize in specifically. And here's why. Um, I'm a father for one. So this, this is extremely important for me as a father. My wife is an educator. Uh, she uh, currently works for San Marcos Unified. Uh, and then my mom was actually next to Gabrielle Giffords when she was shot. Oh, wow. I, our family has been impacted by these issues. I actually went to high school with the shooter. I grew up in, and was raised in Tucson, Arizona. Um, so since that incident in 2011, it has started me down this path of asking a lot of the questions you're asking. You know, what are the consequences? How can we protect ourselves? Is, is everyone being armed a good thing? Is no one being armed a good thing? And uh, what I've done is I have both my master's and my bachelor's in Homeland Security Emergency Management, where I have focused all my studies on school active shooter events. I actually begin my doctorates next month in this exact field because I am just, I am so passionate about this topic uh, because it impacts our lives. Uh, and there's two sides to this. There is how do we protect our kids physically, but then how do we protect our kids and our educators um, emotionally as well? Um, at what point does too much training now have a negative psychological impact? And, it, and it's, it's a hard balance to, to determine. Um, I think that's really interesting that you said that. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about the, you know, and, and I think uh, for me, when I was, I'm looking at my, uh, my oldest son, you know, and he's getting ready to go into kindergarten. I remember when I was a kid, uh, you know, I grew up in Florida and we would have different things, you know, whether it was, uh, you, you know, you get taught stop, drop and roll if you catch on fire. But you would also talk about if there was a tornado, what do you do? And um, if there's a hurricane, what do you do? And, you know, that was a, a traumatizing it was pretty traumatizing to try to, as they're trying to explain to you why you're doing this and what could happen and how devastating it would be. Now you're talking about what if somebody comes into our school and starts unloading a weapon? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I hadn't even, I, I don't, I mean, so I would imagine that a lot of parents may, may even be against that for that very reason. Like I don't want to tell my child, somebody can come into the school and just start shooting it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So that's um, so over this past, past week, I was out in Missouri and I was uh, presenting at the International Law Enforcement Educators and Training Association National Conference, specifically on the role trainers play in um, training um, K-12 uh, stakeholders in active shooter response. So this is the largest gathering of law enforcement trainers in the world. And what I was really trying to get them to realize, and this is all through looking at empirical data. So we're looking at sources through the FBI and Alert and um, NYPD, all, all this data that we've had in the past two decades, is we need to differentiate school active shooter events from other events, such as the San Bernardino terrorist attack or um, the, the shooting um, at the bar up in Northern California. Uh, even though they're under the same the um the same topic of active shooter the consequences and the reactions are completely different the motivations are completely different uh the timelines are completely different 
And that's what I was trying to get these trainers to other, understand. And here's why. There was just an incident out in uh, Indiana where law enforcement were training schools in active shooter response. And they were, um, as part of the training, they shot the educators with airsoft guns. Mm-hmm. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to reinforce to the teachers that a lockdown only approach is not enough. The problem with their approach was they were training the teachers the same way they would train law enforcement. And it was an inappropriate training technique that now completely lost confidence in that audience to the point where actually the teachers association is trying to sue the state to where they can't use any projectiles in their training. Mm. So any benefit that that training might have had was lost because we didn't think about our audience. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the uh, devil's advocate here. Uh-huh. Right. And, and it's cool because you and I both were Marines. So let's let's look at it from if I was just being a real crappy, salty Marine. Right. And uh, wanted to go the other other direction with this. So as we both know, um, when put into a situation, whether it's a firefight or somebody unloading in your direction, general, you know, uh, everybody's going to react differently. And I think a lot of the reasons why we did the training that we did is to almost numb yourself to what's going on around you so you can actually perform in the moment. So I've actually heard this. So I I read a lot of the news stories on that same incident. And uh, I don't know if I, if it's, it's, I guess you can call it an incident. We'll call it what it is. Um, And, you know, being shot with projectiles and, you know, you hear some people are like, Oh, well they need to, you know, toughen up. What if it was real? Um, You know, that's, that's how it's going to play out. You should actually get used to it now before it actually happens. You can react differently. And then you have other people saying, well, it's completely unnecessary because what you're trying to do is teach them these steps and processes and they're going to lose confidence in actually wanting to learn because they aren't, they aren't in the military. Right. They aren't. They aren't in the military. They're just they're they're U.S. citizens that are trying to do the best that they can. So, I I mean, and honestly, I don't know how I feel about it. And it's probably because that's not what I specialize in. And and when I had the conversation with a couple of my friends, I had even said this is, look, this is not what I specialize in. I can talk to the military. And, yeah, I agree. I think when you're put into that situation, everybody's going to react differently. Um, But I. I think you can't make somebody or you shouldn't make somebody deal with punishment and pain um, in order to try to teach them uh, what the steps they could or should take in, in, a, in an active shooter situation. But, but again, this is why I specialized in. So what do you personally think? I'd like to hear from somebody that this is what you do for a living. Yeah, so the, I, I think you hit the nail on the head that the, the concept that they were trying to get across um, primarily was that – a lockdown only approach is it's actually not in compliance with best practices. The Department of Education since 2013 says that we have to have what's known as an options based approach. Most people are familiar with the term run, hide, fight. Um, it's not one that we we personally support. We think there's gaps in that. But in general, it is you have different options. You as an individual get to choose which option is best for you based off of the information available. So what the officers were trying to achieve by shooting the, the teacher with the airsoft guns was like, look, if you do this lockdown only approach, here's the consequences. Well, the problem with that is, is, is exactly like you said, by doing using that training technique, they completely distracted the audience from the objective of the lesson. And then beyond that, there was different ways to achieve that same learning objective without introducing what's known as positive punishment where you get pain, right, in order to reinforce a point. Um, there's different ways to achieve that. Uh, they could have used case studies. They could have used the data. They could have told the stories of victims, for example, other educators, uh, that were lost during these tragedies. There's different ways to reinforce that. And more importantly, teachers already know the consequences, right? Teachers don't need to be shot to be reminded what the stakes are in these situations. Um, And it was unfortunate. And that's where for us, we're looking at the data, um, being uh, professional trainers ourselves, training law enforcement. We're actually bringing two of the largest law enforcement active shooter trainings here to Southern California over the summer. Oh, wow. 
specifically because we want our regionally, we want law enforcement to have as much exposure, as much training as possible in these situations. And it's going to be a um, interdepartment um, response There's, or a multi-agency response. There's going to be multiple agencies um, responding to these incidents, and we want to bring them as much of those tools and techniques as possible. Okay. So I'm, I'm writing down like a couple notes because I want to make sure I go back to it. So, and I'm going to come back to what you just said. I want to go back to run, hide, fight. So you mentioned run, hide, fight, and you said that you think that there are gaps in there. You also talked about the, the full blown lockdown approach that there is a major gaps in that as well. So you, uh, as an expert, you know, you're, you're one of the biggest experts out there. What, what, in order to protect our children and protect administ uh, the administrator, you know, administrators in a school and the school teachers, what, what do you think? What would Morgan say? This is the real approach that should be taken for an active shooter. If an active shooter comes into a school. Yeah. So ju I just want to go back and talk about lockdown real quick. Okay. Lockdown so let's talk about lockdown. Yeah. So lockdown was developed in the 1980s and it was actually, it came out of LA Unified and it was developed in response to gang violence, specifically drive-by shootings. So if we examine lockdown and how it was originally created, the threat that it was created for was a threat that was outside of our facilities. And the threat wasn't a, a student from inside of our facilities, meaning they're not actually a stakeholder with us. So if we look at it, um, and we examine who the actual threat is, especially in high school and middle schools, it's something like 98% it is a current or former student, okay? okay. Uh, and then the threat itself, where does it materialize? It starts in the classroom, right? It starts in the hallway. Something around 50% of school active shooter events take place in a hallway or a classroom. Um, cafeterias are, are followed up behind that. So oh. what is if the only thing I've ever taught my students to do is to get under to lock the door and get underneath the desk, that is not effective given the actual threat assessment. They've never been taught or trained what to do if the threat actually materializes within our space. Uh, and that's why you have such a high casualty rate and it, it is exponentially different than any other crime or active shooter incident school active shooter um, events, there's a one-to-one -one kill to wounded ratio. Wow. So every one um, teacher or student killed, there will be one wounded. That, it is unheard of. And Marjorie Stoneman Douglas is a perfect example. 17 killed, 17 wounded. Hmm. What are the reasonings for that? Well, the reasonings for it is because the attacker is, he's part of our facility. It's a prior or former student which means that he can defeat our infrastructure that's in place because he knows what doors to go in. He knows right. how to get around, um, you know, maybe the possibility of a student or a teacher checking bags, right? He knows the side doors. Uh, beyond that, and this is going to scare a lot of people, that, that student that's going to shoot up that school, he gets to do a rehearsal every single day he walks the halls. Every single day he gets to rehearse and plan his attack every single detail. And we know um, based off of uh, studies done by uh, the Secret Service and U.S. Department of Education, there is typically a high amount of planning in these events. Mm. So that's why lockdown isn't appropriate because the way that it was created doesn't match the realities of the threats we're facing. So basically what you're saying, just, just so I can make sure I wrap my head around it, because it's funny because I remember when I was younger – what we were kind of taught and trained. So what you're saying is it's not like it's some disgruntled grown person that's just coming in from off the streets and says, you know what, I'm going to go shoot up this school, which a lockdown approach. If somebody that wasn't familiar with the environment, wasn't actually planning, didn't have the ability to walk through, create kill zones, plan it. They're coming in. So a lockdown approach would probably be more, it would facilitate the need. The truth is that a majority of it, it's somebody that's already in so it's a student or former student. They know the they know the areas. They they have a mission. They've already planned it out. And therefore, if you're just trying to lock down, you're you're already at a disadvantage. You're already in a losing situation by the time they start unloading because they've already they've already been prepped. Um, wow, that's 
That's yeah. that's and, pretty and wild not- because I mean they're still pushing a lot of this stuff. When I see it, I was watching something on the news the other day, and they're showing these new handy dandy straps that go on the door. So you might be one of the 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 doors away from where the active shooter is, where you might get lucky. But in that case, anyways, I I, I would want to go with the run uh, hide fight approach personally. Yeah, but so, and, and it's not that lockdown in itself can't be effective given the threat. For example, there was the uh, school shooting by an adult um, in Carl's. <laughs> Uh, where he went to an elementary school and started to shoot from the outside in. Okay. Perfect example where lockdown works. We're not saying that securing your safe space doesn't work. So here's another, um, I like to do hashtag real talks. Okay. So real talk, there has not been a single incident where a school active shooter has made entry into a locked or barricaded room. But there has been dozens of students that have been killed or wounded inside of those locked and barricaded rooms. So what does that mean? That means securing your safe space is a viable option given the threat, but we're not training our students and our teachers in the proper way to do that. And again, Marjorie Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, perfect example. Those students, the majority of them were inside of the room where they were killed or wounded What did the shooter do? He shot through the window because students didn't know where to best place themselves. Right. So let's talk about that now because I love what you were just about to say. So A, and and I was actually just sitting here thinking about this. Okay. You lock up the room. I know even like we were trained, uh, how does a round travel? Uh, You know, so you're trying to get low on the ground. How does a round travel? And I would imagine, uh, I think people are confused. Yeah, you lock the door, but uh, bullets, depending on the type of round being used they go through walls they go through windows they go through you know so if you're just going to get under your desk and sit there you're literally just a target yeah Uh, you're a soft target yeah and unfortunately that's what we see and the reason we see that a lot is because lockdown has become an all hazards approach meaning if there's an earthquake you duck and cover if there's a tornado you duck and cover if there is a um, hurricane you duck and cover right if you during a lockdown, what do you do? You get under your desk and you duck and cover. It's become this easy all hazards approach. And I don't blame educators. I don't blame principals. I don't I don't blame school boards because they're not experts in this field. They're there to teach my son, you know, to reach his goals in life. And they don't understand these concepts. And that's why as experts, when we go through what we do is we look at policies and procedures. We look at infrastructure and then we actually observe the current drills. So that way we can essentially talk about what we're talking about now. Where is that best place? Um, and I would love to give you a direct answer, but I can't because it's site specific. Right. But generally speaking, if there is, let's just assume there's one entryway into that room and there's windows along that same entryway where the door is, the safest place for that teacher or educator to be is actually up against that window, below that window, but up against that same wall. Mm. It goes to exactly what you're talking about. Based off of geometries of fire, if that individual decided to shoot through that window, there's no one that can be injured because there's no one in, in within that line of fire. Right. Interesting. Okay. So now we talked about, uh, and I'm, I got like, I got a few questions I've been writing down here. The run, hide, fight approach. Uh-huh. Run, hide, fight, which I think if I were given two choices, one being uh, duck and cover, which I like that you said that, which is true. Um, and that's what we were taught when I was when I was a kid. Uh, if I had to choose between locking down uh, my, my door, which I still or locking down in general, I I'd still would want the door to be locked down. But I still love the idea of run, hide, fight to where I can actually choose options or if I was if I was a teacher, I can look at the situation, see what's going on and then try to make a decision based off of what you know I had been taught. And that's why I think this is important that's getting taught in our schools to the administrators. Um, But uh, you said that there were some gaps in that. So uh, why is that? Yeah, so run, hide, fight, it's a great simple model. And here's what options-based means. An options-based response means that each individual user, even students, get to choose the option that is best for them based off of the information they have available. And it's a fluid response. So you don't have to run, and then if you can't run, then you hide. If you can't hide, then you fight. You can choose any option at any time based off of the information available. The problem with run, hide, fight um, is that it was not designed specifically for teachers and educators and K-12 facilities in mind. 
It was uh, designed back in 2012, created by the city of Houston with a DHS funded grant specifically for adults in workplace violence. Hmm. So the problem with the message is, and this is exactly what I was talking about when I went to the um, to, to present at this training over the past week, was the message is not differentiated to the audience. We're not figuring out, hey, I'm training a teacher now that has a special education class. How does this apply to her? Or I have a group of kindergartners who aren't going to be able to make those decisions and now does lie on me. Or I'm training sixth and seventh graders who can be more dependent and, you know, uh, choose an option that's best for them. Right. So the problem with run, hide, fight is the message for one. The second biggest problem with run, hide, fight is it does not emphasize or is there there is not a specific component for how to warn or alert the campus. School active shooter events, nearly 60 percent are over within two to five minutes. Wow. And Problem is, we're depending on a 911 response. There is an emphasis on calling outside help to come in and save us. But the truth of the matter is, they won't is be there. In the vast majority, it's, um, I think it's something like 68%, okay, of active shooter events are ended before law enforcement even arrives. Wow. So the problem with run, hide, fight and what we see throughout uh, all the different schools and districts that we work with is there is not an emphasis or sometimes not even the capability to warn the campus quickly. Um, and I, I like to re refer to Marjorie Stone and Douglas because it's, it's, it's been a year, but it's so fresh in everyone's mind. The first, what they called a uh, code red, which was their essentially their lockdown, it didn't go out until five minutes into the attack. Wow. The attack ended a minute later. And then we all know the, the lack of response by law enforcement in that situation where they didn't make entry into the building. They were just there on campus. Right. So there has to be this emphasis, um, not just on how do we warn? What are the policies and procedures that allow us to warn the campus? But what is the infrastructure in place? Um, for example, does my PA system work if the fire alarm is going off? Right. Um, right. Am I using a mass notification app? Do my educators have uh, radio capabilities to communicate? All those different things. And then more importantly than any of that, do teachers and all staff under no uncertain circumstances, have they been given direct authority to initiate an active shooter or an options-based response, or whatever response they're, they're, they're working with? And we have seen this. We've gone to schools. You're going to think I'm kidding. And consistently, this isn't just an anomaly. We have gone to schools and we have asked educators because we survey all the educators as part of our process. If there was a fire right here, right now in, in that dumpster or in that trash can, whatever it is, what would you do? And right. the consistent response we get is we would call the administrator um, and they would be the one that pulls the fire alarm or that initiate, initiates that response. Wow. So Oh, just in a fire that's just so a fire that's in a dumpster a in a dumpster so what i'm trying to get at is as as leadership we need to make sure that our um our staff members that they're empowered and that they know that they have the authority to initiate a response that they know how to initiate that response and that we have the infrastructure in place to be capable of initiating that response and, and because we have minutes. This will be over in a matter of minutes. I think that's what got me, you know, as I'm listening to this, I think that's what I was shot. Okay. So I'm trying not to be, I was shocked with what you just said. I'm thinking about uh, firefights I've been in, you know, when I was, when I was overseas, you're talking about two to five minutes of pure violence. And, I, and I, 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 I don't think everybody can wrap their heads around that. From what you just told me, you have somebody that has had time to plan. They have figured out they know their battleground. They know they're in. They know how to get out. They know their targets. They know soft targets. They've planned this thing. And then you have two to five minutes of pure violence. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in there, you have an admin, you know, potentially administrations or, or, or teachers that haven't been trained to even deal with how to deal with a fire. 
now you're trying to say, okay, how are you going to deal with an active shooter when they come into the school or if they come into the school? That's, that's crazy. Yeah. And I encourage people and, and we provide all of our resources to our clients. Um, go and read the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas initial report. And it is a scathing, scathing report, not just the law enforcement response, but of the responsibility of the school in what's in their failure to train. Um, so part of our job as consultants is not just to help prepare our stakeholders, but also to help uh, mitigate liability. So when you're talking about a civil lawsuit against a school, and, and these are things that they end career, they, beyond the lives that are lost, these have drastic, drastic consequences. Um, you're talking about deliberate indifference. And what that means is the school knew that they had a standard to train to, but they didn't train to it. How about this for a standard? Since 2013, the U.S. Department of Education has said lockdown is not enough and that we need to use an option, options-based response. A school is not winning that lawsuit. Right. Okay. Uh, so, and, and then you also have what's known as um, uh, disparaging treatment. What that means is, okay, I know there's a threat out there. I'm only going to train my certificated staff and I'm not going to train my classified staff or I'm only going to train staff members. I'm not going to train our students. Well, why is this person more important in getting that level of training, but this other individual isn't? So it's another thing that um, schools, and I just don't mean public schools. I mean private schools. I mean, if you are a faith-based organization that has a pre-K program, you have a responsibility and an obligation to those same standards. Um, and I don't say that as a scare tactic. I say that because it's the truth. It's truth. And okay about consequences it's not just the loss of life but what are the civil consequences as well right so you know you got to look at it all across the board and what's going on so i i want to bring up some uh because i'm sure it's going to piss somebody off uh but i think there are questions that need to be asked because these are the questions that are taking place in our nation right now when every time this has happened it creates questions uh because it's 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 so uh horrific it's so horrific when there's a school shooting. So uh, the, one of the arguments, uh, we talk about uh, having police officers on campus. Um, now I know there was a shooting where a police officer was on campus and he was ineffective. Um, but what are, having, do you think, do you view having a police officer on campus as a deterrent or do you think that that is part of, uh, you know, having multiple uh, means of dealing with a potential active shooter. I mean, what, what are your views? Yeah, I think, um, have, well, first of all, whether or not we should arm t teachers, it's irrelevant here in California because the state has already said that's not an option. So, um, Oh, actually, you know what? I, I don't mean to cut you off. It looks like somebody actually brought this up too. Thoughts on trained armed security personnel on campus. Perfect. So there's somebody actually asked that. Thanks, Tommy. Yeah. Okay. Go on, Morgan. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, no worries. So um, we're not talking about arming teachers here because it's irrelevant here in California. The state already said it's not an option. OK, uh, when we're talking about armed personnel, first of all, we'll, we'll talk about law enforcement um, personnel. Uh, I it, having any armed presence is it, it is going to act as a deterrent in some situations, but it's not going to be a deterrent in all situations. It, the Santa Fe High School shooting, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, they knew that there was an armed officer on campus. So you have to understand that a lot of these attackers, they don't plan on coming back from this. Right. They're looking to either self-terminate terminate or termination by cops. So they're, they're looking to end, you know, not survive this event. Right. right. Uh, so to say that someone armed on campus to deter a full active shooter, I, I don't think is, is intellectually honest. Uh, but if we're talking about response, absolutely. If you have an armed personnel that is able to respond, uh, then you're going to be able to end that uh, threat more quickly. So if we're, if we're doing another hashtag real talk here, 40% of school active shooter events are ended by unarmed staff members, principals, administrators, teachers, and or students. Okay, 40%. so let's, you, just said, you just said something, unarmed. So explain to us as unarmed, what exactly does that mean? Because I am going to bring up the second question. I know it's not the case in the state of California, but it's been brought up. So let's yeah. talk about unarmed first. So this means that someone is making the very personal decision that they are going to counter that attack, right? 
um, whether they're phys physically subduing the individual uh, with the gun or if they're somehow, and these are very, very rare circumstances, so I don't like even bringing them up, somehow able to talk that person um, into stopping um, their attack. Okay, 40% are, are um, ended by unarmed school staff or students, right? Wow. Uh, in terms of school active shooter events, only 7% of these events are ended by an officer shooting the suspect. Only 7%. And I would imagine because so, you talked about two to five minutes of freaking violence. You know, yeah. that's, yeah. That's, not a, that's not a lot of time. No, and this is why. This is why the data has to drive anything we do. It's no different from an educator who says, well, what are the best practices and what is the data for me writing my math curriculum? The same thing applies. The same concept applies to emergency response. So if we look at the data, 70% are ended before school, before um, officers even arrive. 40% are ended by unarmed um, staff or students. Okay. And then somewhere around um, about an equal number, something like 46% are self-termination mm. by the suspect. Here's the key though with self-termination is that we have to look at when that happens. When does the suspect decide to self-terminate? Well, typically there's three times. One, they're out of victims. There's no one else around. So they decide to end their own life. Um, two, they are confronted. So they believe that they're going to lose the fight. And a lot of times it is that unarmed teacher or student confronting them. Or three, they believe that they're going to be taken into custody. Mm. So even some people will say, well, yeah, they're more likely to commit suicide than anything else. Well, when are they committing suicide? It's when the fight is over, right? right? So those are the keys there. Uh, in terms of training, like, um, you know, I've heard calls for, hey, let's get um, former military to guard our schools and things of that nature. I think those things are all said in good faith. Right. But you and I both know being in infantry Marines, just because you're part of the gun club doesn't mean you gun. Right. right. And there are so many considerate. I would not want a random person at my son's school that isn't trained to an extremely high standard. It's it's a whole different. So, OK, I, I agree with you 100 percent on this. And, you know, I've I've actually got into an argument with a buddy of mine over this. Like, oh, you know, we should go down there. And I'm like, you know, if 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 I had random people that are previous military for you know what on whatever level let's say you get some of the best ones it's different when you're talking about having six seven eight year olds nine year olds uh you know children uh in in a in in an environment or in a situation let's say it did turn into a full-on fight um i don't know if that's a whole you need training for that there's there's i mean let's be honest um, hell, it's it, the warfare changed so much from the first when we first rolled over in 2003 to right now. It's changed so much to where, uh, you know, you're constantly being retrained on how to engage with somebody that you say that you have identified as a target. Right. So imagine now trying to put that into an American school for a random civilian. I'm not a fan of that at all. Personally, right. I think I agree with you 100 percent. I think in, it, it said in good you know, it, it, the heart of it, they're, they're, you know, people just want to do the right thing. I don't think that's the right thing. So this is the other big one that I keep hearing about. Uh, well, we should arm the teachers. We should give all the teachers the opportunity or ability to get a concealed weapons uh, permit and to carry while they're in the classroom. Now, in the state of California, that probably will never happen. So let's just talk about in general. And let's say if it let's say it wasn't California, it was somewhere else, and it was an option. What what's your views on that? I uh, so I think that we just have to be clear on what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. when, when anyone mentions arming teachers, it's not a mandate; it is a personal choice. So teachers would then volunteer to do it, right? Right. And there's some jurisdictions that say, "Hey, teachers can't do it, but um, faculty or administration staff have the option to do it." So okay, how do you feel about that before we even get deeper into the subject? So what, what do you believe is the difference between this, the teacher physically and then faculty and staff having, uh, if they went through training, of course, to have a concealed weapon on them? I think it's, um, I, I think it's, it's splitting hairs. I think it's just appeasing one group and, and being able to achieve their overall goal. Look, I'm, I'm driven by the data. I have to look at the empirical data and where does the evidence point 
Okay, cool. So let's 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 look at the data, and then we'll just leave it in general. So let's say just yeah. arming, you know, it, by personal choice, uh, somebody in the school, whether it's a teacher or administrator. The, the data shows us that both unarmed and armed citizens consistently stop the threat um, uh, before law enforcement arrives, and it's just the dynamics of the situation, and they're successful doing it. Uh, if we go back over the tw the past twenty years. Of the cases where armed citizens were present and made the very personal choice to engage the threat, there's only, um, I believe, one um, citizen, maybe two, that has been killed as a result. Uh, there's only been one or two incidents where they were not um, effective in stopping the threat. So if oh. we're looking at the data itself, absolutely, when people make that very personal choice, they can do it. Now, I am the husband of an educator. I'll tell you right now, and I'm I'm a firearms trainer. My wife herself would not feel comfortable killing in schools, and that's completely fine. Um, I had the opportunity to sit on the active shooter panel um, for the ILEDA conference, and uh, we were absolutely blessed to have someone present that um, is out of Ohio who has made the choice to arm teachers, and they run a program called FASTER. Their standards for teachers to be able to carry in schools is actually higher than that for law enforcement. Okay, cool. So you know what, Terry uh, just put up a question, and I love what you just said because I think it's going to play into what Terry it, it asked and also kind of something I wanted to, to double back on real quick. So uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, CCW class alone is not enough. There needs to be additional training. So that's if we're talking about um, teachers. Now let me back up for a second. So from what I heard, it sounds like uh, people that make or, you know, data says people that have made a personal choice um it they are going to be more effective going and then even going deeper they're going to be more effective to actually dealing with an active shooter now let's going back to what you said we're talking about two to five minutes of violence pure violence and the odds are good it's going to be over before the police show up in one means or another and there's the kill zones are already done now i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna come back to this again if we were talking about administrators only and teachers, we've also talked about that this is typically going to take place in a hallway or in a classroom. If it's going to take place in a hallway or a classroom, if and a teacher wanted to make a personal choice, maybe the teacher should have the ability to be armed if the data says that. And now let's talk about training a teacher because in my opinion, which we even talked about this, going back to a different conversation, just having an armed citizen, let's say a former military, somebody like that, having a weapon on campus or at school, I'm not a huge fan of because I, I think there's more going on in that environment. There's more things that need to take that need to be taken into consideration. So if that was going to happen, what do you think they should be getting training on? And sounds like that somebody is already is already doing this. Yeah, yeah. So this isn't just this isn't my opinion. This these are people that are in the space doing this. Um, first of all, when you talk about arming teachers, they're not talking about that teacher leaving their classroom to go and hunt down this active killer. Okay. What they're talking about is giving teachers the means and ability within the space they're already at to protect themselves and those students that are around. It's a means of self in their space, in their space. That's it. Okay. It would be, if I could equate it to a different, um, you know, equipment you might bring, it would be the same as telling a teacher, Hey, you can pick up a fire extinguisher and use that as a weapon, right? You're just giving them a different means. Um, in terms of the training, the standard is extremely high. And I'm telling you, from people that are doing this, it's not just, hey, can you pass this qualification? It is, do you have the right mindset? There have been people that have passed these courses as educators that met every standard needed. And that trainer at the end of the day said, you know what? I actually think you're too aggressive. I'm not going to allow you to, to uh, be able to carry. Wow. Okay, that makes it, sense. It's not black and white. It's not, hey, you meet this and you're, you're okay. Um, a lot of the states that have implemented this, they actually have to go through some sort of psychological background check as well. So there's a lot of these strict things in place. The key thing here is that we're still trying to figure this out. We're at a, such an incredibly scary time in our nation. And this is such a polarizing issue. And I understand that. I think yep. there's two extremes. There's an extreme that says, hey, take away all the guns. 
there's an extreme that says arm everyone. And I don't think either of those are the right answer. I really don't. Um, I think that we need to follow the data. We need to work with the parameters that are set. California says teachers can't be armed. Okay, so then what are our other options? Um, lockdown, we know, isn't enough. So let's explore those other options. How do we train effectively? How do our policies support those? How does the infrastructure support those? And then above all that stuff, how do we prevent this from even happening? Right? Interesting. So it sounds like what you're saying is that there should be multiple things taking place. It's not a, a one-stop shop, single solution for one. Right. And then on top of that, trying to be proactive and addressing, especially it sounds like from what I heard, the data says it's going to be a student or a former student. Mm -hmm. So trying to you know be aware of our environment, you know, and, and, and making sure that we're trying to mitigate it before it ever happens. And then also uh, making sure that through training, we're not allowing our uh, uh, children or our teachers to become soft targets. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, and let's talk about Fallbrook specifically. Okay. Um, Fallbrook has, has taken a lot of great actions over the past couple of years. We know that Man, I, I think almost every year there's been one or two incidents where there's been a threat made against specifically the high school. Right. Um, a lot of that's happening on social media. And they have done an incredible job with their See Something, Say Something campaign. Not only have they told students how to report, but again, they've given them the authority um, to do so. And they've encouraged them and they've built a level of trust by following up on those leads that happened. Um, there's a responsibility for parents, uh, something around 70 to 80 percent of school active shooter events are conducted with a, a firearm that is stolen from a from a family member or friend. Wow. So, I mean, that means that 80 percent of these incidents could have been prevented if someone would have locked up their firearms in a proper men in, uh, method and prevented access. Do you think so schools should actually be addressing parents about that? If that, if we know that it's 80%, do you think that there should be something being produced by the school to reach out to the parents to give them education or at least inform yeah. them? If, if we're going to be effective, it has to be a community-based approach. And I'll give you an example of some of our other clients we're working with. They're actually doing town hall meetings at their schools to not only talk about what they're doing and the new changes that they're implementing, but also the roles and responsibilities of the parents in prevention. And here's the key to prevention. Preventing these acts of violence and creating a really a community of love and a, and a holistic approach. Now we're reducing bullying. Now we're reducing um, self-harm. Now we're reducing um, truancy. You know, if a kid is feeling pressured or, um, isolated at school, he's not going to show up to school. There's, and then you, you start to talk about the whole psychological effect of uh, abusing drugs or alcohol. When we create a culture of love in our schools and an environment where our, our students are, and teachers are happy to go to, they have an adult that they can trust, we're preventing so much more than just you know, school active shooter events. We're, we're, we're really building up our, our, our society for a healthier society as well. Right on, man. That is so freaking true. You know, and it's, I, I love having our conversations. That's why I said, you know, we, we've been so busy, man. So I haven't been able to do as many Fallbrook Village talks. And I know uh, some of the other people on the team that are contributors to Fallbrook Village talk, we're trying to do, you know, three or four interviews per week and put up information for Fallbrook. But I, I know I want to start having conversations with you once a month because I think it's so important um, to talk about these things in our community. I, I think uh, where we go wrong sometimes is people don't want to talk about, they don't want to talk. They don't want to talk. They don't want to address. And, you know, I've seen it, uh, whether it's on Friends of Fallbrook or Real Friends of Fallbrook, where whenever there's been an incident in Fallbrook High School, uh, whether there's a gun or anything like that, it's it, it turns into like this, like, gang pile as if the administration like really screwed up instead of just saying, look, at least steps are being taken. These are conversations we need to have. It's probably going to happen again. Why is it happening? Let's find the root of the problem. Let's see if we as a community can come together and really try to help. Like what can we do to make sure that it doesn't happen again? Um, I don't know, man. I, I, I really love having these conversations with you because I just think it's so important for our community. So yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm here. I'm, 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 you know, I, I joke and those that are educators will, will get this. Um, my, my title, my title is DOSA and that's daddy on special assignment. 
um, there's teachers that go on special assignment to, you know, work in their special areas. And that's really what I am. I'm a father. I'm the, um, a husband of an educator. Um, you know, like I, our, our family has been directly impacted by a mass shooting incident. I am so devoted to this. Uh, we've been asked, um, our company has been asked to go to the California School Boards Association's annual conference in December to be part of a panel talking about what we're doing as well. So our, we just want to get the information out there. Uh, my son, he goes to school here in, in Fallbrook. Um, he's at an elementary school, and I, I just want the other parents out there to know that um, I had the opportunity to sit down uh, with uh, some cabinet members from um, Fallbrook Elementary Unified. And pretty much within a week of me addressing some issues that I observed during, um, or just some questions that I had during one of the uh, school meetings, the coffees with the principals, they had sat down with me. They had actually addressed about three or four of the uh, questions that I brought up. And I mean, actively seeking out solutions. Um, they took about an hour out of their day and they are so busy to sit down and, and discuss more about uh, some ways that we can help make our community safer here. So I just want the parents to know, I wanna give a big shout out to the to the cabinet members. And there was a, a board member that even, uh, she went out her, her way to help facilitate that conversation. Uh, so I just wanna reinforce that here in Fallbrook, they are looking at those solutions. But with that being said, I am a father before I'm a consultant. And you better bet I will hold their feet to the fire um, right. in some certain areas because I would not tolerate it for any else, anyone else's child and I wouldn't tolerate it for mine. Um, but they are being extremely proactive in what they're doing. They're bringing in the county to do some training. So they're doing some great stuff. Uh, I think we got a ways to go here at Fallbrook, um, but I'm excited. I'm, and I'm more excited that there's leadership that's willing to, to listen. They're not just right. turning their heads and saying, no, we got this. They're, they're honestly looking for different voices and different solutions. And as a parent, I, I extremely appreciate that. That's cool, man. Well, uh, Morgan, real quick, let everybody know how, like, so tell us about, tell us, tell everybody that's watching this now that'll watch it later, the name of your business and how everybody can get a hold of you if they want to reach out to you and, and what your business provides. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are DMB Consultants, David Mike Bravo. There you go. Uh, we are an emergency management consulting firm. Uh, we do everything from infrastructure assessments, um, threat assessments, uh, policy procedure review and training. We specialize in uh, pre-K to 12 institutions and faith-based organizations. You can find us on our website. It's dmbconsultants.us dmbconsultants.us. Um, I'm on Twitter at Campus Safety Dad. So if you have any questions there, please feel free, especially the educators. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. If you run a pre-K uh, program here in, in town for a faith-based organization, please don't hesitate. We are here to, to keep our children and our community safe. And I will, I will flood you with all the data and everything I can um, in order to, to achieve that goal. That's awesome. And, you know, uh, and I can't express enough and I, the appreciation I have for uh, Jump It All with me today. And like I said, I want to do this at least once a month with you because it needs to be done. But I think uh, what I, I, I'm hoping whomever watches this, what they get out of it is you can't live on hope that it won't happen to you, your children or in your area. Uh, it, it's happened before. The odds are good it's going to happen again. Uh, I think school systems and parents and students and teachers need to be uh, get your head out of the ground and, and be proactive. See what we can do to actually keep everybody safe. So thank you again, Morgan. I appreciate it. Um, don't don't do want to cut you off, but man, I'll hit you up. Let's get together next month. I actually want to do a separate side one going back to uh, just because I was talking to my wife about it, about some of the gun laws in California. There's a lot of stuff that I just didn't know. So I would like to inform more people about that. Absolutely. Cool, man. Appreciate it. Uh, right, hold on so one much. second because I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. I'll talk to you for two secs, all right?
Okay. All right, everybody. Hey, out there, uh, Fallbrook Village Talk, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we appreciate it. I hope this is just really good information. We got a lot of views uh, today and a lot of comments, over 21 comments so far. Um, so thank you, everybody, for watching. I know there's going to be a lot more after this. So as you put up comments, whether you're on Friends of Fallbrook, Real Friends of Fallbrook, uh, some of the other pages where this is going to be posted to, or if you're on Fallbrook Village Talk proper, um, leave more comments, and I'll try to have Morgan an answer those uh, as they come up. So thanks, everybody, for watching. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you later. All right. Bye.